Hi, I'm uh, I'm a research fellow at uh, CRI in Paris, which is the Center for Interdisciplinary Research. And uh, from, uh, from education, I'm actually a physicist. I'm a soft matter physicist. And I started a research group uh, last year doing uh, some physics-inspired machine learning. So all of the work that I'll be presenting today, our main, uh, most of the work has been done by Gertjan Bott, which is a PhD student in our group. So actually, I want to start this, this talk with a, uh, with a criticism that I hear a lot, at least from the physics community, at least, uh, about machine learning, which is that machine learning has proven that it's really good at detecting very intricate patterns from data. And it's really, it has, a, it has a high predictive power, but that oftentimes it's difficult to get interpretable models from machine learning. And uh, this dichotomy is actually captured by the two fields within machine learning, which are statistical machine learning and the symbolic machine learning. And so the goal of uh, our research group and also the, the, the topic of the stock where we try to, to develop tools to discover interpretable models uh, for quantitative science. And the examples that I will show now will be mainly in the, in the context of physics, but we also try to apply it to uh, other fields like synthetic biology and uh, developmental biology. So our approach is to combine the statistical power of neural networks with the symbolic power of regression. And essentially what we'll try to do is assume you have a noisy data set so you measure a certain quantity over space and over time. And what we'll try to do is try to discover the underlying distribution or the underlying PDE, so a partial differential equation from this data. So essentially what we do is we write down a partial differential equation, uh, U of T, and the, the subscripts mean the derivatives with respect to uh, that value. So uh, du dt equals a very complicated function which can depend on U, which can depend on spatial derivatives of U, a very complicated function of combinations thereof. Actually, what we do is we construct a library with, uh, with different candidate functions. So we rewrite this uh, partial differential equation as a matrix vector product, where theta is actually the library. So we construct a library with all different possible terms. And then we have a vector xi. And we can, this obviously is just a regression problem in that case. So the, the goal will be to try to discover a sparse solution of this vector xi. So this vector xi actually, in this case, you can see it contains a lot of zeros and some non-zero terms. And actually these non-zero terms uh, tell you which of the terms to what extent feature in the partial differential equation. The reason that we're looking for a sparse solution of xi is that typically in physics, at least the hope is that if you have a model, that it doesn't contain too many terms, so that, that it's a limited amount of terms. So this sparse regression is something that has already been around for years, but applying it to real data has always been a, a challenge, mainly because this approach is very sensitive to noise. So if you try to construct this library from a noisy signal, so if I get, assume that you have, for example, 5% of noise, you can see that if you have your function u, if you calculate a derivative, and if you calculate the second, especially the second or the higher order derivative, that if you have a noisy signal, if you use finite difference, or if you use even more complicated schemes, that's really difficult to calculate an accurate library, so to cal calculate accurate higher order derivatives. So numerically calculating this library is really difficult. The solution that we present is to use a neural network to learn the mapping xt to u and to actually construct this library with respect to the inferred solution and not with respect to the actual data. So the way that we, that we approach this is to include the regression task within the neural network. And I'll, and I'll show at the end why this is really important to do this within the neural network and not to just use the neural network to learn the mapping and then to do the regression. So essentially, if we train our neural network, we define a loss function. So the loss function that we use here contains three terms. The first one is a mean square error, where essentially we try to learn the mapping. So we just learn the mapping xt to u. The second term is the regression term. So we try to optimize, does that work? We try to optimize theta times xi minus a temporal derivative of u hat. So again, of the inferred solution. So note that this 
vector xi is a coefficient vector. So this is what we try to optimize for. So we try to, opt uh, we try to optimize all the weights within our neural network to learn the mapping xi to u. And at the same time, we're also trying to optimize this vector xi. We also have a third term in our, um, in our loss function, which is a L1 penalty on this vector xi. This is essentially to promote sparsity. Turns out actually that, for me at least surprisingly, is that we, for everything that I will be discussing afterwards, we don't really need this L1 penalty, but it helps to converge faster. So it speeds up convergence. So again, we're gonna train a neural network to learn this mapping and at the same time try to discover the, uh, the coefficient vector that corresponds to the differential equation underlying the data. So what happens during training? So here I plot the, the different cost functions as function of the number of training epochs. And let's focus on two lines. So the blue line, which is the MSE, so the mean square error part of the cost function, and the orange line, which is the regression part. You can see that initially, the MSE gets optimized and at some point starts to saturate, and that the regression term only really starts to become optimized once the mean square error is already optimized, which makes sense because uh, optimizing the regression term, which is actually trying to find the underlying uh, PDE, can only be done once the mean square error is relatively low when your neural network actually has some sense of, of, uh, of the data. So if you look at the different coefficient xi, function of the number of epochs, you see that as long as the mean square error is not somehow converge that all these coefficients go all over the place and at some point they start to be learned and essentially at the end, so this is the Burgers equation, you get two non-zero terms that, that remain. So to give you an overview, so all this, uh, all this code, so DeepMod, which is the name of this, uh, uh, of this algorithm, can be, is, is, uh, can be found on GitHub. Uh, so essentially you have a noisy data set you have a, a neural network that learns mapping input to output. You have the regression term within your neural network and you try to find a sparse solution Xi. So doing this regression within the neural network help, actually helps you to promote or to, uh, to prevent overfitting. So if you would learn, if you would only train your neural network on a mean square error and afterward doing the regression, you can see that for example, this red term, uh, this red uh, solution which is um, the solution after X number of, uh, of epochs without the regression, you can see that you start to overfit. So you start to learn the noise. If you add this regression term within the neural network, you prevent this overfitting to a large extent. So to show you to what extent this works on, uh, on, on, uh, on some test cases that we ran it on. So here's the Burgers equation. So we try to, to uh, uh, to apply this on the Burgers equation. Here at the x-axis, this is noise level. So this is white noise that we added to the, to the numerical solution. So this is all artificial data on which we added white noise. And this is the number of uh, samples that we needed to find the right solution. So if it's red, it didn't discover the underlying partial differential equation. And if it's white or blue, it did recover the right equation and the value is the, uh, the percentage of error in the coefficients. Typical regression uh, uh, algorithms, so sparse regression algorithms, needs thousands of data points and usually fail at noise levels up to two to 5% for the Burgers equation. You can see that with as little as 100 data points through space and through time, so this is very, very little, we can go up to noise levels of 10% white noise and still discover the right differential equation. If we go up to uh, in the order of two, uh, thousands of data points, we can go up to noise levels of 75, 80%. If you look at the results in that case, you, cannot, you, you can barely see the, uh, the signal anymore. So we apply this also to other cases, so to higher order PDEs, coupled equations, higher dimensional uh, PDEs. So I'm claiming that this works extremely well for high noise levels. So Sparse regression is something that is, is there for a longer time, but it's really difficult to apply on real data. That's what I claimed in the beginning. So over the summer, we tried something very simple. So we did a very simple experiment to actually try this on real data. So we went to the lab. We did an electrophoresis. Uh, we took an electrophoresis system. So you have a gel, and we actually pipetted uh, a simple loading die in the gel. 
this dye should start to diffuse. And it's also charged, so if you put on an electric field, it should start to advect. So what we did was, we did this experiment. This literally took two days. We took the experiment, we made pictures with a Pi camera, then we subtracted the reference image without the dye. Then we had roughly an estimate for the density. It's not perfect, but just by feeding the algorithm these images, we did discover from a pretty big library the advection diffusion equation, and then depending on the size of the electric field, we could vary actually this, this velocity, this advection velocity in, uh, in this curve. So this is actually model discovery that works for real experimental data with very high noise levels. Another application, which I would not really have time to, to discuss today, is actually we're also interested in uh, getting the models from single particle tracking data. So single particle tracking data, you have a trajectory. For this trajectory, you have to do a density estimation. Then you get the, uh, the evolution of the density as a function of time. And then from this, you can do our, our, our classical model discovery and try to discover, for example, diffusion equation, uh, advection random walk, persistent random walks uh, worked, chemotaxis, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that we, that we noted in, in this analysis is actually that we need a lot of trajectories. So we need a lot of single particle tracking data. So actually, we, we try to have a look, a closer look at this density estimation. Because classical approaches for density estimations, like kernel density estimation or binning, all have a problem that you have to predefine uh, either a, a binning size or a, a width of your kernel. So it turns out that it didn't work that well. So we needed a lot of data. So what we did was we used a concept which has been discussed today, which is the uh, normalizing flows. And we've actually, uh, to some extent, extended these normalizing flows to include the temporal access. So actually we use a neural network to link the different frames uh, uh, so the, uh, the different uh, density estimations through time. And with this, we could get a time-dependent density evolution. So I'll not have time to discuss this in more detail, but we actually put the paper of these uh, temporal neural flows on an archive recently. And actually, this would potentially allow us also to discover uh, partial differential equations with conservation constraints. For example, the, the Fokker-Planck equations, so where, where you conserve the number of particles. Okay. So this brings us to the end of my talk. Uh, and I would like to thank all my, uh, all the group members uh, that worked on this. I wanna thank uh, Cree. And I wanna uh, remind you that this whole framework to do model discovery on, on data can be found on GitHub. We have a version in TensorFlow and we have a version in, in PyTorch. So if you wanna try it on a, on a, on a real data set, uh, please uh, go ahead. And last but not least, uh, I have a postdoc position available, so if anyone is interested in working on this uh, over the next year, then uh, please let me know. If, if you know anyone that might be interested, uh, communicate it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot. We have time for questions. Yes. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, one question. So, the, uh, so this... Um, there's a extra loss that's well, that is a kind of a regular riser between the neural net and the the uh, uh, basically the uh, the same OD but written on this basis of no function. So if you already uh, uh, know this basis and uh, uh, what what do you, what does the, the neural net brings on top of uh, just directly fitting the theta coefficients to the data, for example? Yeah. So that's a very good remark. So in, in principle, our, our library theta is much bigger than the terms that are that feature in your equation. And it turns out that you can choose this, this library very big. So you can get uh, tens of terms, even of the order of 50 different terms. And then actually, since we're optimizing for xi, it will actually find a sparse solution for xi. So it will tell you which of these terms feature in your equation. And then the coefficients in front of these are the, are, the, are the terms that are in your equation. So alternative, what you can do, which is, which is the, the physics inspire, uh, informed neural network, the PINs, where actually, if you know which of these terms feature in your equation, you just build a library with only these terms. And then you can use this to fit uh, uh, your equation to the data. But in this case, it's model discovery. So you try to find your underlying model. Where it's crucial that actually, and this is important, 
that your model is somewhere in your library, of course. So this is one of the obvious limitations that if the right equation is not in your library, it will either not converge or it will give you wrong results. Very nice. Uh, so this is all linear equations. So w would this model work if you enrich with a uh, nonlinear linear term, cross yeah. term? Yeah, we, we, in, in principle, you can build this library with nonlinear terms. Okay. So that's absolutely not a, not a limitation. Yep. Slava, one more question. Thank you for the really great and interesting talk. Just one question. When you have the third term and you try to constrain the sparsity by L1, actually it does not impose any constraint on the support where you will have a non-zero coefficient, right? Uh, don't you think that, for example, using sort of the adversarial loss that can be trained really for the, say, all, you do not know what is that, but just for the scene supports, and then imposing that as an extra constraint would be more suitable instead of L1. That, that might be a good, that might be a definitely a good option. So actually the, the L1, we just put it into, in, into this algorithm because we thought if we don't put an L1, we get a solution that, that is composed of a lot of, of all the different terms. You'd actually start to overfit your vector xi. For some strange reason, well, for some reason that for me was absolutely not obvious, that actually doesn't really happen. Even, even without this L1 term, you, you're, you don't overfit your vector xi. You still get a very few uh, uh, terms, even for high noise levels, that fit your equation. The, the convergence is much slower, but that doesn't really seem to be a big of an issue. And it's surprising to me too, so I, I don't really have an intuition for that. Let's. All right, I think we should close here. Let's thank uh, Remy again.